anyway, let's get started. Uh, well, thanks for coming. I want to talk about some uh, software design principles. Well, as programmers, we often get excited about design patterns. Design patterns play a very vital role in almost everything we do. But I realized that there are two problems with using design patterns. One is we quite don't know what pattern to use. Second, we may actually end up using the wrong pattern. And then after a while, I realized that the most important things really are learning about some design principles. A lot of these principles have been written about quite, uh, quite a while ago and quite strongly. So these are not really new at all. But in a way, these are pretty timeless. And the second thing I realized was that almost every single design pattern I pick, I then started asking the question, what's the design principle that's the force behind this pattern? And then I realized there was a very nice way to connect them. If you take a problem and realize what principle applies to the problem at hand, and then you look at a pattern and figure out what principle is in the force behind it, then if the principles don't match, maybe that's not the pattern you should really apply. So that could be a really interesting way to explore this as well. So that's one of the reasons that I'm really going to spend the time talking about design principles, because I think design principles pl play a much more important role than uh, uh, patterns themselves. Uh, where, do we, where do we use them? Well, we use them almost constantly when we develop software. This is, these are the principles I use every single day uh, that I write code, I design code, and so we can continue to use them. And of course, uh, this is playing a very vital role in the code we create and the design we create. But why use them? Because I find that these principles can help us in general to create uh, software that is a lot more easier to extend, uh, software that is easier to maintain, and, and so on. And uh, of course, when do we use them? I find these principles are very useful, especially during tactical design or as we do test-driven development, this is extremely useful. So just about any corner we turn in developing software, I find these to be useful. So we'll talk about some core design principles that we could actually use. So let's talk about, um, you know, how many of you write code, program code? Okay, that's great, thank you. How many of you design software? Everyone who raised the hand should be raising. Because you cannot be writing code without designing, right? So this idea that somehow we design separately and then write code separately is just a myth. Everyone designs code. You may come to me and say, that's not true. I work with Joe. Joe never designs code. He, all, he, he never designs. He only codes. I'll tell you, very secretly watch Joe when he codes. You'll notice Joe is doing this. And then a few minutes into it, he'll do this. And then code like this. What is that when he looks up the ceiling? That's called JID, just-in-time design. So you do design all the time, right? So we are doing design every single day we code. So, and code and design, code and design are very intricately you know, connected. So we're going to look, talk about some principles. The very first principle is from the pragmatic programmers. And I want to start with that principle. And this is a very important principle to think about because we tend to forget this quite often and that can be really troubling for us. So what is this principle that I want to talk about here, so-called the dry principle? Well, the dry principle says, um, you know, every, every piece of knowledge. And uh, if you really think about it, um, what do you and I do periodically at work? Every piece of knowledge, don't worry about the spellings here, knowledge. So uh, what, are you, uh, what, do you, what do we do on a regular basis? We are knowledge workers, isn't it? We are converting our decisions. We are converting our ideas. You implement rules, you implement knowledge in code. So every piece of knowledge that you create in a system uh, should in essentially have a single unambiguous uh, and then, of course, not just that, authoritative, uh, so authoritative uh, representation. And so, in other words, every piece of knowledge should have a single and un unambiguous authoritative representation. Well, this comes very naturally to us. We duplicate code, we duplicate knowledge without even realizing it. But what happens if we start duplicating things every corner we turn? Well, when we duplicate it, that knowledge gets spread out through the system. 
And the time comes you have to make a change to it, what happens? You got to change in multiple places, isn't it? I was working with the team not too long ago, and one of the developers told me, every two months I fix the same bugs over and over and over. I said, oh my gosh, does somebody actually wait there for you to fix it and then wait for a month and then put it back? He said, no, 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 no. This code is duplicated in so many places, I keep discovering this code and we fix the bug. And I said, okay, so how do you feel about it? He said, that sucks. And I said, so when you do discover this is duplicated, before you fix the bug, you do take some time to remove the duplication, you refactor the code, right? He thought for a minute and said, that's a great idea. Well, how do you ever improve if you never refactor the code to remove the duplication? So in other words, what you want to do is to look for places where there could be duplication of code. Duplication of code is not the only duplication. There are two kinds of duplication we should really think about. Well, oftentimes we care about a duplication of code, but more important, think about duplication of effort. Duplication of effort is extremely important to think about. And sometimes you have to really think about how many times you're doing the same different thing. Like for example, one of my aha moments years ago was, you know, when I wrote applications, normally I would make a change to the database. And the minute I change it make to the database, I'll change some objects that talk to the data, then I'll talk, change the controllers, and then I have to change the controllers, I have to change the view, and then I have to make more changes, and then I'll shrug my shoulder and say, that's life in the big city, what can you do? You gotta make all these changes. When I started learning a, a technology like Ruby on Rails, I was amazed because one day I decided to, that, I, that I really need to make a change to the way that I represent the data. So I made the change to the data, and then I spent a few minutes thinking about what code I have to change because I made a change to the data type. And I could not figure a code I have to change. So I was a little confused, honestly. And I was telling myself, I don't understand what code I have to change because I, I did make a very drastic change of the data type here, but I, but I can't figure out a code I have to actually change. And then I told myself, heck, just run the application, see what happens. And I ran the app, and the app showed the data in the format that it should show based on the type. I was blown away. I'm like, wow, how smart this is. It figured out what the type is, and as a result, it adjusted every bit of the system accordingly that was a dry principle from the ground up. So we should really think about keeping the code dry. You know, I do quite a bit of code reviews along the way, and oftentimes when I talk to developers, I would say, well, let's keep this code dry. And that's another reason I like these principles, because they become really nice vocabulary for us to use when we communicate with the team. So when I tell my team, let's make this dry, I don't have to say a lot more. They get it right away, and they can go back and refactor the code to remove the duplication. So one of the principles to keep in mind is this dry principle and see how we can eliminate this as much as we can. Let's talk a little bit about another thing that I think is extremely important, and that is the Next principle, which is a bit controversial, but I think it's really important, which is called the YAGNI principle. Well, the YAGNI principle stands for you aren't going to need it. How many times do you find developers, including ourselves, writing code that we don't actually need? And then we end up with a bloated software. The software does everything except what's really required, right? And as we are writing code, every one of us is subject to this. As you're writing code, you're writing this and you're saying, oh, I gotta think of this edge condition. I gotta think of the other edge condition. And you start putting all these logic in place and then slowly the code becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and it becomes really bloated. What you really want to do is to ask the question, do I really need to write the software, this particular code? I'm sure you come across developers who are saying, hey, do you have a minute? No, I'm very busy. What are you doing? I have to finish this code. What does it do? I don't know yet, but I got to finish this, right? So we have to keep writing this code all the time. You know, I can only speak about what I know. Uh, I live in the US, so in the US there's a tradition. You go into restaurants and you order food, they'll give you insane amount of food. I mean, unbelievable amount of food. So always I think about the question. When I get the food, I ask, wow, that much food, what are they trying to tell me? Is this my last meal, right? Because they give you so much food. 
I went to a restaurant in Houston and uh, where I had just come back from a travel. I was just starving. I was hungry. And I sat down and he said, I would like to order food. So the waiter came, in, came over and said, what would you like to order? I said, I want this, 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 and this, please. In a very straight face, he looked at me and said, who else is joining you for a meal? I said, I'm alone here. I'm just going to have the food. He said, is that all for you then? I said, absolutely, that's all for me. I'm starving. I need this food. He said, I won't serve you. I got really angry for a minute. I said, what do you mean you won't serve me? He said, that's too much for you to eat. And then he kind of measured me with, with his eyes and said, for a guy with, with your size, I don't think so. And I was about angry. I'm going to say something really bad. And then he said, let me pose a challenge to you. He said, but what is it? He said, I'll get you half of what you ordered. And you finish eating and say you want more. I'll get you the other half, but it's totally free of charge for you. I said, now we have a deal. So he gave me half the food. I, I ate half of what he gave me. And then he came back and said, would you like me to bring the rest one? It's like, no, thanks for putting innocence in my mind. But that's what is important, not to take the money away, but to really put sense into people. So ask the question, what are we implementing? Do we need this feature? Why are we doing this? Let's postpone it until we understand it more. Well, we can all agree. Do you agree that you're smarter today than you were yesterday? Most people, others are still in doubt. That's okay. I mean, the day, day is still early. So yes, we are smarter today than tomorrow, which means you're going to be smarter a week from now than today. You're going to have more information at your hands. So by postponing implementing something to a later time, it gives you two things. You can focus on what's important now, and you can do later something that you will know more about later. And that's basically what the Yagni principle talks about. But when you talk about the Yagni principle, I often work with developers who get really agitated. And when I say you're not going to need it, they get angry. So I usually throw in this one little word that makes a world of difference. You're not going to need it yet. And they're like, can I do this tomorrow? Sure, let's talk about it tomorrow. And we just repeat the same thing the next day until we can release the product and we don't have to ever do this. So postponing things is a good thing, so reduce the amount of code you're going to write. That's generally a good thing to do as much as you can. Well, we talked about two principles here, and to reduce what you do and to remove duplication of code as much as you can. Now, when it comes to things, often people say, do I really have to remove duplication all the time? Well, you have to remove duplication most of the time, but you can think about, is the code really expressive? I don't want to make the code less expressive and remove the duplication. Remember, these are not really fundamentals that you follow. These are kind of dials on a radio. Sometimes you have to compromise a little bit here and a compromise a little bit there, and there are trade-offs, and sometimes these forces will kind of act against, act, uh, act against each other, and you may have to kind of move them a little bit. And so, of course, there's no compromise to using common sense. We have to keep asking those questions. But one principle I would argue is probably the most important principle is so-called the single responsibility principle. So what is the single responsibility principle? Single responsibility principle says a module of code, whether it's a function or a class or a component or a system, should focus on one thing and one thing and only. This is another name for cohesion. So what is cohesion? Cohesion is where a piece of code that you are writing is, so this is cohesion, and cohesion is where a piece of code is narrow, focused, does one thing, and one thing really well. So you want to really make the code cohesive. Now, the, obviously, the question is, why? Why should I make the code cohesive? And the reason is, it really comes down to economics. So imagine for a minute, your code is doing seven things, and you're going to make change to this code. Why would you make change to this code? Because one of those seven things changed. So there are seven reasons for this to change. Here is a piece of code that does exactly one thing. OK, that's not a good sign. Uh, so it, it does exactly one thing. So what does that do? It focuses on one single responsibility. When would you have to change this code? When you change that responsibility. Well, the frequency of change for the code on this side is one compared to seven on this side, for example. So a code that does several things has to change more frequently. 
let me put what cohesion means in a much simpler context. My parents tried really hard to teach cohesion to me when I was a child. I grew up on the streets of Chennai, and you know, it was a lot more fun to go play out on the streets than to be in home, because when you're home, you get lectured. So you, your logic really is, you come from school and you immediately exit. So I spent a lot of time on the streets. That's what I was, a street boy. And my parents would tell me, Venkat, you got to keep things properly lined up. I would come from school, I would open my drawer and throw my stuff in there, and I would exit. If you ever open my drawer, you'll be scared. Because in there you will find books occasionally. There'll be toys, there'll be sock, some use, some not. There'll be other parts that I don't want to talk about. And then there'll be snakes occasionally. I mean, you, you would be surprised what you find in it. But the beauty is everything mixed up together. So if I ever wanted to get a red sock, I would find one of them, the other sock would not be red. You need to have people to go search for you. So they tried really hard to say, if you only put things away properly, this would not be a problem at all. What if you put your sock in one draw? What if you put books in another draw? What if you put a toys in another draw? But that was no fun at all, because my work was optimized to throw things in, never optimized to take things out. I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, my dear God, this guy appears to be such a mess. How did he turn out to be the way he turned out to be? I got married. That fixed everything for me, right? So, you know, sometimes a spouse can teach you what parents cannot teach you, right? That's life. So, but now today, there is something beautiful in my house. The kitchen has utensils, what a concept. And my books are in my bookshelf, no knives on the bookshelf, right? And that is exactly what cohesion really is. So the point is, you write a piece of code that deals with database. Don't put business logic into it. You got a piece of code that does the business logic, don't put the UI code in it, but why? Because it's cohesion, it reduces the cost of change, that's the whole idea. But let's take on this a little differently. We are always confused about cohesion, so I want to spend a little bit more time on it. So please do raise your hand if you think long methods are a good idea. Not a single person. He, he, was, he raised his hand, but he was scratching his head, <laughs> wondering why would, anybody would do it. So not a single person raised the hand uh, that, that long methods are a good idea. A different question for you. Raise your hand if you see long methods at work. Notice that. That's called cognitive dissonance. We all know not to do it, and yet the code is long. I'll tell you why your code is long, because I know it. You didn't do it. Because you just told me a second ago, right? Long methods are a bad idea. You didn't do it. The sad part is the people writing long methods are at work today making those methods longer as we speak, right? So, but, but why? Why is it such a bad idea to write long methods? I need your help here. So tell me why. Why are long methods, long methods, uh, methods bad? So fire away. Oh, it's uh, low cohesion, isn't it? It does a lot of things. Awesome. What else? Difficult to what? Oh, difficult to test. What a beautiful word. Difficult to test. You are trying to look at this code, and you're like, the number of combinations, permutations you have to use is so many, right? One more thing. Not only is it low cohesion, it is a high coupling, isn't it? Now, what is a good quality of a good design? High cohesion, low coupling. What does a long method have? Low cohesion and high coupling. This is like the farthest away you could be from good design, isn't it? In every corner you see. What else is the news? Oh, hard to understand. Think about this for a minute. Hard to understand. You have been told to go debug this code. And you are looking at this code and saying, what's going on here? You know what's the title of that person? Not a programmer, victim. Right? You are a software victim. That's what it is. You're like, what the heck does this do? So it's really hard to understand. What else? Hard to change. You are, actually, it's very easy. You change the job, not the code, right? You're like, why? Yeah, it's hard to change. What else? Oh, hard to maintain. 
<laughs> yeah, there's hope here, maintenance. Okay, what else? Go on. Oh, hard to refactor. Uh, okay. This is a sad, sad part. Leads to duplication, isn't it? There's this long method. And you come to it and say, you there. That's the part I want. It says, I'm here. I want to reuse you. No, you can't. So long methods become longer, right? Because you're going to duplicate it. Hard to reuse. We could keep going on with this, right? We could keep going on with this. There's so many reasons not to do it. And yet, people write long methods. So I know what you're asking. You're saying, when could we get it? We all told you we don't do this. The problem is not us. The problem is the person at the office still writing long methods. What can we do about that person? I got one suggestion for you. You can try this. Maybe you will get the results. So go to work on Monday. Don't say a word. Just sit down quietly, keep working. The person you know, the one who writes long methods, comes to you and says, hey, you're already at work. How was your weekend? You could tell how the weekend was. You could say, oh, the weekend was great. I went to the movies on the Saturday, went to the park on Sunday. But don't say that. Instead, you say, oh, my weekend. Exactly at 7 o'clock, I got in the car, pulled the car out of the garage, took a right turn, drove for about three kilometers, took a right turn, went and drove for another seven kilometers, took a left turn, but that was a wrong turn to take, so I came back again, you turn, and then I took a left turn, I went for another seven kilometers, and then I went around about three times by mistake, and then I took, just keep going like this for however long you can. At some point, your colleague would say, excuse me, have you gone mad? You say, no, I thought I'll tell you how my weekend was, like the way you write code. So the, the point is, when you talk to people, what are you doing? I went to the park on Saturday, I went to the movies on Sunday. What have you just done? You're giving them two pieces of knowledge. What does your colleague most likely say? They don't care about the you know, movie that you went to. Hey, which park did you go to? Oh, I went to the park by the main street. Really? Is it a family-friendly park? Oh, of course, it's the entire family. What kind of activities? Notice what we are doing. We are stepping into detail after detail after detail, leaving behind the movie, but we are drilling down. What does this really mean? Well, let's understand this a little differently. Let's talk about what's the longest method you have seen. What's the longest function you have seen? Throw a number at me. 5,000 lines, we go here. <laughs> what was yours? 20,000 lines goes here. Anybody else? This sounds like a very bad auction, isn't it? <laughs> I was speaking in DevOx Belgium in 2015, November. It's an auditorium. They have 800 seats in front of you. It's an IMAX theater. You as a speaker is a little tiny figure here. And the room is dark. I can see what's in front of me. And Sai asked the same question I just did when I gave this talk. And deep down from the middle of the room came a voice. It said, 40,000. I said, your entire application is at one function. <laughs> I asked him, where do you work? In hell? <laughs> and as soon as I finish the talk, this guy comes over. And he says, I'm the one who answered the question. I could see in his eyes he was not lying. <laughs> I said, what happened? How did this become 40,000? He said, it's actually worse than that. I got hired to refactor that function. <laughs> I, I, I said, brother, you should have called us. We would have saved you. This was in 2015. In 2016, he came to me and said, do you remember me? I said, how could I ever forget you? <laughs> and he said, I don't know why, but I have this bonding with you now. I feel like I have to update you because a year has gone by. I said, I'm all ears, tell me. He said, I got good news for you. Remember I told you it's 40,000? Uh-huh. Well, it's only 30,000 now. <laughs> so. So both of us agreed we'll meet this November to get an update. So I'm waiting for six more months, honestly. So you said 20,000, that's really bad. So if I tell you 200 lines is long, okay, not everybody, but quite a few hands. 100 lines is long, a few hands down. 50 lines is long, a well, fewer. 25 lines is long, a lot less. 10 lines is long. Somebody raises a pinky now, okay, <laughs> fine. 
Well, so we don't agree on the number of lines, right? You see that, right? We couldn't do this. Somebody the other day, other day said, I'll give you a better metric. I said, I'm all ears, tell me. They said, if you can see the entire function in one screen, and the minute you say it, somebody says, what's your font size? That doesn't help either, right? So it turns out we have been looking at this really wrong. It's not the number of lines of code that makes a function long. It's the number of levels of abstraction. Let's step back for a minute. What did you do for a weekend? I went to the park on Saturday, went to the movie on Sunday. What is that? One level of abstraction. I did not tell you what the park is. I did not tell you what the movie is. I didn't tell you which theater I went to. I didn't tell you where the park is located. I just told you what I did for the weekend. Went to the park on Saturday, went to the movie on Sunday. You can ask me more details about one or the other, and I will drill down into the level of abstraction. So the whole point is, a function should focus on a single level of abstraction. So the length of a function is not vertical, it is horizontal. If you have a lot of indentation, and the minute I said this, one guy said, you guys indent the code? That's dangerous. But the point really is, it's the number of levels of abstraction that matters, and this is called the SLAP principle. So the SLAP principle stands for single level of abstraction principle. That's what you really are after. So what you want to use is this idea of the compose method pattern. So the compose method pattern says that a code should be composed of operations which you can drill down further to ask more details. Now why this SLAP principle is so important is, I've had people come to me and say, I don't like short methods. And I would say, gosh, why don't you like short methods? And they would say, because my application has way too many short methods, I cannot understand them. And I was scratching my head, why do they say this? And the other day, a developer came to me and he said, I am completely confused, because you always have told me to break methods into smaller methods. In the last code review, you asked me to combine two methods into one. Oh, I don't understand this. Why are you now going in the opposite direction? I said, oh I'm, oh, I'm really glad you asked. The reason I ask you to break methods is not because they are longer in length. The reason I ask you to break methods is because they are doing too many levels of abstraction. In this case, I asked you to combine two methods into one because both the methods actually are on the same level of abstraction. They don't deserve to exist alone, bring them together. So it's not like we take a measuring tape and say this is long, instead look at the number of levels of abstraction and start breaking the code. That's a much better way to maintain the code. So we talked about the single responsibility principle and it's really about abstraction responsibility to focus on. The next principle was created by Bertrand Meyer. It's called the open-closed principle. And the open-closed principle, kind of weird name, isn't it? What does the open-closed principle say? It says the software module must be open for extension, but closed for modification. That's what it says. A software module must be open for extension, but closed for modification. Sounds like a magic, isn't it? How could you change a piece of code, but not actually change it? Well, the whole idea is we want to extend software. A software system is going to change over time. If somebody comes to you and says, we designed and created the software, but we never ever changed it after that. What they're telling you is the project got canceled. Because any project that's relevant has to change over time. But you don't want to change a software by changing a lot of things. You want to change a software by changing fewer things. And so if, a, if you're trying to change a software, you want to really minimize the times it would change to provide extensibility. Let's understand this with a little example so we can see what that really means. So let's say for a minute right here, um, we have a class called, oh, let's call this class as engine. So I have a class called engine, and the class engine, of course, is going to have, let's say, a method which is going to be the toString method. Let's just start with the toString. That's all I'm going to start with here. So in this case, I have a little toString method that's going to return the string. And in this case, of course, I'll just simply return just the word engine for now. So we'll say get class, how about that? So dot get name. That's a good start, we'll just leave it for now. 
Then I have a class called, let's say, car. Well, the car has a constructor, and the constructor is going to take two things. It takes an engine, so we'll say engine. It also takes an ear, so we'll say ear. So I got two properties coming into this. But of course, I'll set the ear as a field, and I will also set, let's say, the engine as a field as well. So let's go ahead and set that up. So far, so good. But what am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to write a two-string method here too. And in this case, I will return the ear of the car plus, let's say, the engine of the car as well, so plus engine. So fair enough, a little good start. Let's create an object and play with it. So I'm going to create a main method, and I'll say car, car1 equals new car, and let's say 2017 comma new engine, and I think we can just output the car1 and see what the result is. So in this case, of course, no surprise, it tells us that the car has, you know, year 2017, and of course, the engine, of course, it displays the engine value. Let's actually go a little bit step further. In this case, in the engine, I'll also output, let's say, plus, let's go ahead and put a dash here and then say plus the hash code. So we can take a look at the hash code value also, and clearly, there, there you go. All right, moving a little forward, what I want to do is to make a copy of the car. Car2 equals new car, car1, and I want to output the car2. Notice right off the bat we got a compilation error. Why is there a compilation error? Because Java says you don't have a copy constructor. How many of you programmed in C++? Oh, quite a few hands. So in C++, it gives you a copy constructor automatically. But it messes up a lot of stuff. And a lot of C++ programmers, me included, have wasted a lot of time because a copy constructor is provided by default. When Java was created, they want to remove the problem. So they said, no copy constructor for you. That somehow got rid of the problem. Well, now, of course, how do I make a copy of this object? Well, we'll say use a clone method to copy. Well, clone has a few problems in itself, but let's ignore that for a minute. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to say, in this case, car, car2, and rather than using the clone method, what I'm going to do is to write the copy constructor right now. So I'm going to write a copy constructor. We'll call it as car other. And what am I going to do in this car other method? So help me out here. I'm going to say ear is equal to other dot ear, correct? OK, so we did that. I'm going to say engine is equal to other dot engine. What do you think? Is that a good idea? No, you don't want them to share an engine. You want them to have a separate engine. New engine and other dot engine. And I'm going to create a new engine object here. Now the compiler says you cannot do that. Why? Because engine doesn't have a copy constructor. OK, let's fix that. So we're going to say public engine. And then, of course, engine other. And of course, what are you going to do here? Really nothing. But the compiler now is unhappy. Why? Because the, the engine doesn't have a regular constructor now. OK, let's go ahead and provide the regular constructor, public engine. And what does the regular constructor do? It does nothing, too. Isn't this beautiful? We keep writing code that does nothing. OK, so we wrote this class. And let's go ahead and run this and see what it's going to do. Well, of course, in this case, we wrote a copy constructor, which is public car. And that's going to take the other car and, and work with it. So what are we going to do in this example? Let's go ahead and run this little code and see. Well, notice that the different engines, the different hash code, everything worked just fine. So life is good so far, isn't it? Let's say a few weeks go by. And now we are told we need a specialized engine. So class turbo engine, and the turbo engine says, I'm going to extend engine. Well, because it's extending an engine, I'm going to write a constructor for the turbo engine. I'm going to write a copy constructor for the turbo engine as well. Great. Now that I added the turbo engine, I'm going to come here and change this to a turbo engine. Question, will this code compile? I'll give you a clue, yes or no. <laughs> what do you think? Yes, it'll compile because turbo engine extends engine. So it compiles. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go run this code now. And when I run this code, what's going to happen? Oh dear, while our first car had a turbo engine, the second one ends up having an engine. 
So the code compiled, but it's broken. So we got to fix it. So I'm thinking about it for a minute. Oh, there's a very easy way to fix it. Why didn't I think of it? All I'm going to do here is if the other dot engine in, in, in engine is an instance of turbo engine, then I will say engine is equal to new turbo engine, and then turbo engine, and then other dot engine. And then, of course, if it is not, I will go ahead and do this. And of course, when I run the code this time, you can see that the first one has a turbo engine and the second one does too. So that's my solution so far. What do you think of the idea? Great, go for it, or ter terrible? <laughs> Here's the, anybody works with this guy? <laughs> that's what I thought. Nobody raised the hand. See, I see that? Now you know why. Sorry, you work with him? You said, <laughs> I'm really sorry, brother. My goodness. And he waited this long. <laughs> you always have to think positively. This is, this is job security. Yeah, I agree with him. It's terrible, right? Why? Because every time you have to change this code, you got to come and change it. While it may be job security for a while, it's a job you begin to hate after a while as well. So we want to really engage polymorphism, right? So polymorphism is the key. So what we can do instead of doing this is a slight different change. What we will do here is, rather than this, we'll engage polymorphism. So what we will do here is, we will call a method here called well, in this case, we want to make a copy of the engine. So engine is equal to the other dot engine dot, let's call copy. I'm specifically not calling clone here because I don't want to get into the description of clone. We'll just say copy. But what is copy, though? Copy is a polymorphic method. But notice, I'm going to make the constructor, the copy constructor, protected. When you make the copy constructor protected, you cannot call it directly from the outside of the hierarchy. But then I'm going to create a public, uh, in this case, engine copy. But in the copy method, I turn around and, and call new engine this. So it's not the problem with the copy constructor. It's a problem with lack of polymorphism. So I turned around and call the copy constructor. Likewise, I go to the turbo engine make the copy constructor protected, and then I'm going to write copy here too, but this is going to turn around and call its own turbo engine. So what is the benefit of doing this way? The benefit here is when we run the code this time, you can see that the code is working, but if tomorrow we create a piston engine, and then in this case, of course, we extend from, let's say, engine, and of course, we implement, in this case, the copy constructor of this and the uh, you know, uh, constructor of this as well. But we're going to implement the copy method. But this one is going to return. What is it going to return? The uh, return new piston engine this. And it turns around and call it, calls its own protected copy constructor. But the beauty of this is I can change this to a piston engine. I'm not changing the car in any way, and the code is extensible, hence the open-closed principle. So open-closed principle says a software module must be open for extension, but closed from modification. This is what we see a lot. The reason we encapsulate classes is because we don't want a change to a class ripple through the system. We want the change to be contained. And that's one of the reasons why we have things like open closed principle. This is a principle I find extremely useful. When I do code reviews often, I would say, hey, this code is violating open closed principle. Let's go take a look at it. In other words, here's a yardstick to use. If you introduce a new module of code, do I have to come and change this module of code? Then that would be a violation of open closed principle. But be careful, though. Don't apply these principles in isolation. Like I said earlier, there is a dial you have to turn. Sometimes you bring two principles together, 
Complexity may brood if you apply them in the wrong place. So you have to always ask the question, does this make sense to use it here, or should I postpone it and maybe uh, apply it a little later? Uh, sometimes you have to be using the Yagni principle in applying the principles themselves. I'm a huge fan of this mantra, and, and that is, this one rule I try to follow quite often, and that is make it work and then make it better, uh, uh, better real soon. And real soon is important as important. Make it work, but make it better real soon. So the fact that you make something work gives an opportunity for you to understand what you're really doing then come back and improve what you have written. Don't try to optimize and make it better before you make it work. Then we get neither the optimization nor the solution at hand. So make it work and make it better real soon is something we should really try to use. That's a good thing in general. Well, given this, let's move on to the next principle here, which is called the Liskov substitution principle. The Liskov substitution principle was created by uh, Barbara Liskov, and she said, that we need to really rethink about inheritance. She says, use inheritance uh, only for substitutability. So, um, so let me type that word here, long word. Uh, so use inheritance only for substitutability. Well, we often tend to use inheritance for two reasons. One is for reuse. We say, here's a piece of code, I wanna use that code, so I'm gonna just use that from here by inheriting. Well, that's really a bad idea. Use it for substitutability. Well, what in the world does that mean? So I'm gonna say, if a class B should be used anywhere, so if, if an object of a class B should be used anywhere, an object of a class A may be used, may be used, uh, then use inheritance. If an object, uh, object of a class B may use an object of A, then use delegation. So in general, delegation is better than inheritance. So you want to use delegation for reuse. You want to use inheritance for substitutability. We often misuse inheritance by using it for the wrong reasons. But why is this so important? Why is LSP, Liskov Suspicion Principle, so important? Well, the reason is Liskov Suspicion Principle says the user of a, of a base class uh, should be able to use an object of the derived class without knowing the difference, right? So in other words, if I am using an object of a base class, and if you give me an object of a derived class, I should be able to use the object of the derived without ever knowing that you gave me an object of a derived class. That is true substitutability. But you may ask the question, why? Why should I not know whether it's a base class or a derived class? Because if I begin to know whether it's a base class or a derived class, I'll be violating the open-closed principle. So Liskov Suspicion Principle is trying to protect us from violating the open closed principle in the instance of inheritance. If I'm gonna be making decision based on whether it's a base class or a derived class, I will be violating the open closed principle. So LSP is trying to protect me from violating OCP in the instance of inheritance. So for that reason it says, the very simple rule, and it says any any, so any advertised, so advertised uh, behavior uh, of the derived class should be, so should be substitutable, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the advertised behavior of the base class. This is a huge burden, right? Uh, so you are saying any advertised behavior of the derived class should be substitutable for the behavior of the base class. Which means, if I'm gonna write a class that uses your class, I don't have much burden. I only worry about my business. But if I'm gonna inherit from your class, I better be compatible to your class. I have to follow a lot more in order to accommodate this, not less. So let's look at an example of this real quick. What does this really mean in the context of what we do? So quickly, let's look at one example here. 
I want to take this uh, example of a class called, you know, let's call it as a base, or class A, let's say. So I have a class called A that I'm going to create right here. And my class A, uh, let's see if I can reach to the top here. There we go. So I have a class A, and class A has a method, uh, you know, public void f1. And, and then, don't worry about what this method actually does. Doesn't matter. Public int f2, again, don't worry about what this method really does. It doesn't matter. But now you are told the following. You are told uh, the, that create a class B uh, where it has f1 and f2 like in A and, let's say, f3. So I'm going to say class B. And I'm going to write the method, which is public void f3. But now I have to implement A and uh, F1 and F2. So what is the temptation? You have read this book, and the book says delegation is better than inheritance. And you say, absolutely, amen, brother. I completely agree with you. And then you put it away, and what are you going to do? Class B extends A, isn't it? Why? Because you're going to say, it's so easy, right? I mean, if you have to use a delegation, what do you have to do? You got to say class B, you got to create an object of A, then call the method F1 and call into it. Too much effort, isn't it? But with inheritance, you don't have to do anything. But the problem now is, anywhere I can use an object of A, you can pass an object of B. But is that your requirement? Did it say that you should be able to use an object of B wherever A is used? No, then you shouldn't be using inheritance. So what do you do? What you really want to do then is, you can say over here, private A object, and then you could say public void F1, and then you can say object dot F1. You can do it this way. And then you can say public int F2. And then you can say return, in this case, return what, object dot F2. Well, you may look at this and say, gosh, you got to type all that stuff up, and that's going to take time and effort. There is two ways to solve the problem. Find somebody really fast to type it. So that's one way you can get it done quickly. Or it turns out this is such a common problem that you can say extends A, and then you gently right click on the IDE and go to refactor. And then in the refactor, it is so common, there is one little refactoring thing called replace inheritance with delegation. Just click on that one. And then you say what you want to change, you tell, select the methods you want to use, and click on refactor, and before you can blink your eyes, it does that for you. So you can either find a fast typist or a tool that can do this for you. But the point really is, there is one problem though. Even though we may have avoided the problem right now, we traded one problem for another. Good news, we're not violating the Liskov separation principle. Bad news, we are violating the dry principle. We duplicated the effort. And in fact, we actually violated the open-close principle still. How so? If I now change class A, your class B is broken. And if I change the method signature of class A, B is broken. So now you're stuck between two. Should I violate LSP or should I violate dry and OCP? If you have no choice, I would say violate dry and OCP here because you take the pain you don't give the pain to the user of your class. But ideally, you don't have to violate any of those. It's a little hard to do this in Java. There's a project called Project Lumbuck you could use, but I'm going to show this example in Groovy instead of uh, Java. So switching over to Groovy, let's see how languages can easily handle this. I got a class called Worker. The Worker has a method called Work. So let's say Work. And what does the work method do? It simply says over here, working. So let's go ahead and try this out to be sure it's actually working. So we'll say, you know, define Sam is equal to new worker. And then, of course, we'll say Sam.work. And you can see that it calls the work method that's working. But let's take a slightly different approach. We'll create a class called manager. As you would expect, manager does absolutely nothing. So now, of course, I'm going to say define Bob equals new manager. But I'm going to say Bob.work. This is an alien concept for a manager. And the manager says, really, are you serious? I want to do work. But this manager is a very smart manager. So what does this manager do? The manager says, I'm not going to implement a work method. So what are you going to do? 
He says, here's the deal. I'm going to write the manager class right here. But within this, I say delegate worker victim equals new worker, <laughs> right? So now what I can do is when I run this code, you can see that it called work right here. In fact, this manager is extremely smart because you look at, we talked about how the OCP was being violated, but look at the beauty. Now I'm going to write something called, uh, you know, write report. And then, of course, you're going to say output, write report, right, writing. Well, you can come to the manager and say Bob dot write report as well. And what does the manager do? Simply delegate it to the worker. But, you know, keep one thing in mind. This worker, we are the programmers, we know how things is, right? There's a method called vacation. I'll tell you what my kind of vacation is. My kind of vacation is write code at the beach, right? I mean, that's what I do. Um, I kind of sneak my computers around so I could be writing code. But of course, the manager has real vacation. So define vacation, and what does this say? Output all year long. So in this case, of course, if it's a bob.vacation, of course, the manager is very smart not to delegate that to the worker. So you can see how languages can implement features that can help us to use delegation a lot better without being dragged into. Like I said, you can look at Project Lombok. You can do similar things in Java as well using third-party libraries, but that's an example shown in Groovy right there. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is the dependency in, in, uh, uh, inversion principle. And for this, I'm going to give you an example without writing a single line of code, but by giving you a slightly different example. We often do tight coupling. When we do tight coupling, it becomes hard to extend the code. Well, loose coupling can help us to evolve the code a little bit easier, a little bit better. So in terms of the uh, coupling, let's consider one example here. So this reminds me of my experience uh, traveling to Norway about roughly 20 years ago now. So this was the day before that, you know, uh, the way that we know cell phones and smart devices and internet and all that, all that stuff. And I went to the hotel there, and I'm a person who wakes up very early in the morning. So I'm an early bird, I wake up pretty early. Well, I went into this hotel, I checked in, and I found something a little uh, weird. They didn't have a coffee machine. I went and said, hey, where's a coffee machine? They said, we don't give coffee machines. I said, look, I can't survive without coffee. And I argued endlessly until the receptionist said, you know what, take my coffee maker, keep it with you, I'll take it from your room at the end of the week. So I was very happy now I had a coffee machine with me. Well, I spent the afternoon getting ready to teach a class the next morning, and I was ready to go to bed, and I looked around, and I was in a little bit, you know, a little bit of a panic, because I look around the room, and the hotel did not have a clock in the room. And I hit a panic. I said, oh my gosh, there's no clock in the room. And they, remember, these were the days before the smartphones, so I don't have a thing that will go buzz. So I went to the clerk uh, at the hotel and said, uh, excuse me, and she rolled the eyes and said, here comes the devil again. What do you want? I said, I, you know what, there's no clock in the room. What's the matter with these Norwegian hotels? They don't give you anything that starts with a C, maybe. No, no coffee machine, no clock. And she said, yeah, we don't give clocks. And I said, I I'm really sorry. How do I wake up in the morning if there is no clock? She looked very confused and said, what do you mean you need a clock to wake up? I said, look, here is this poor guy called Venkat, and he depends on this clock. And she said, I don't get it. Why do you need a clock to wake up? I said, you see, by my bedside, I have a clock. In the morning, it makes such an ugly noise, I cannot sleep for the rest of the day. I want something like that to wake me up. She said, oh, you want an alarm and not a clock. I stared at her and said, don't get technical on me, lady, <laughs> right? And technically, she was right. I need an alarm and not a clock. I said, yes, 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 I need an alarm. And she said, we got, you got an alarm in your room. I said, but I didn't see a clock. She said, you don't need a clock. OK, fine. I didn't see an alarm. She said, did you turn on the TV? I said, no, I don't watch TV. She said, you will this week. So I went back to my room, and I found the remote. I turned on the TV. What a novel idea. It came on and said, welcome to the hotel, Venkat. This is your alarm, too. I was like, wow, this is amazing. TVs can be alarms, too. But I'm a big fan of TDD. I'm not going to take good faith in it. I set the alarm to two minutes from then, and I turned it off, and I waited. 
And two minutes went by, and it came back on. I said, this is awesome. But repeatable test is important. I said it for another minute, and I turned it off, and I waited. And a minute later, it turned on. But I noticed something a little weird. But before I turned it off, don't ask me why, I changed the channel, and I turned it off. But it came back on CNN. I thought, that's a weird feature. But anyway, I left it. Now, you've got to imagine this for a minute. Just close your eyes and imagine it. I'm in a dark, dark room, and suddenly I hear a voice. I freak out. I said, where am I? Why is the room dark? And why is somebody talking? I've never gone from 0 to 180 so fast. I jump out of the bed, and I saw the most scariest thing ever you can imagine. In front of me, in the TV, there was this guy in suspenders saying, Good, you know, welcome to Larry King Live. Have you ever woken up to Larry King Live? I had to go into therapy when I went back home. This was the scariest moment. Now that I was awake, bringing down the volume, shutting it down, I thought, hey, this lady taught me a good lesson in software. I've got to tie this back to this somehow, right? So what did she teach me? She said, no, Venkat cannot depend on the clock. Venkat should depend on this abstraction called alarm. What's the benefit? Now notice, if I depend on the alarm, I can have several different implementations of the alarm. When I'm home, my clock is my alarm. I'm going to, the silliest thing I'm going to ever do, draw UML in, an, in a text pad. So right there is my alarm, and this alarm is going to be implemented by my clock, as you can see right here. So right there is the implementation of the alarm sitting right here, but then I realized that a TV could be an alarm, isn't it? So I could use a TV for the alarm. But that day I realized I'm not going to wake up to Larry King Live again. So I took my computer and wrote an ugly program on it. That would make that ugly noise in the morning so I can wake up. A computer could be an alarm. Or you could also have other people that could be alarms too. A friend, a colleague, or a relative. So humans can be an alarm too. So you notice you could have various different implementations of the alarm, and this gives you the extensibility. Because I can be the person I am, but I can use different implementations of the alarm. Well, once again, if you notice, this is called the dependency inversion principle. Why is it a dependency inversion principle? It's because the concrete class human should not depend on the concrete class clock Instead, both the concrete classes, human and clock, should depend on the abstraction, which is the alarm. You are inverting the direction of dependency. If you really think about it a little harder, you realize dependency injection inversion principle is there to honor open-closed principle. So we keep coming back to this open-closed principle. After all, object-oriented programs are created to provide extensibility, and extensibility comes through polymorphism, so it turns out Bertrand Meyer's principle, open-closed principle, is a very vital principle to follow. Well, let's look at what we just did so far in this presentation. We talked about a number of principles that we can follow. We started with the so-called dry principle. We talked about the Yagni principle. Then we said single responsibility principle, and then, of course, the open-closed principle. About substitution and inheritance, we talked about the Scott-Substitution principle. And decoupling, we talked about dependency injection inversion principle. You probably have heard the term called solid principle. Well, but I did not quite use the solid directly. I did two more things. I talked about the dry principle and the Yagni principle. And the reason I'm not putting the word solid is, while solid is good, I don't want to be restricted by solid principles alone. Of course, D is for dry principle. This is for Yagni principle. The solid principle is single responsibility principle, open-closed principle, the Liskov substitution principle as we know it, and then finally, of course, the dependency inversion principle. Hey, what is this I? I stands for the interface segregation principle. The reason I didn't talk about interface segregation principle is it's more of a cohesion at the interface level. It says an interface should focus on one thing and not on multiple things. In other words, an interface itself should be cohesive. And I didn't talk about that because cohesion is really important. This just narrows to one area. 
But also beyond solid, we also have to really think about dry and Yagni as well. So if you don't do acronyms, maybe you could call it as a disold principle if that pleases you. But the point is, I find these principles to be extremely vital to what we do, and we can greatly depend on and benefit from these principles. Personally, I've used this principle for quite a while, and I can tell you uh, a firsthand experience, I use these principles every single day when I write code, every single day when I sit and design. I found them to be very useful. I hope you do too as well. Thank you.